We've been doing this series because of end times. We've been doing this series on the seven churches of Revelation. And uh, this is the last of the last. This is the church of Laodicea. This is number seven. We started it last week, and I'll just do a quick review of that before we get going. But many people believe, and I believe, because seven is the number of completion. It's finished. It's done. Many believe that the church of Laodicea is an example of the church that will see the coming of the Messiah. Now, let me say this. Oh, toda raba. Let me say this. We are not the church of Laodicea here at New Beginnings and our stream family, but we are. We are not, but we are. And you're not going to understand that until I get to the very end of the, of the message. Read with me in the book of Revelations, chapter 3, starting with verse 14. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of all creation. Now, very quickly, what God is saying is simply is that if I say it, you can take this to the bank. Amen. I don't exaggerate. I don't lie. I don't say things that aren't true. What I'm saying here will absolutely happen. Say amen. amen. You are neither cold nor hot. And I could, I, I wish that you were either cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, you know, when I was sitting at my desk writing this down, we said this, I think we said this last week, that these are the harshest words that Jesus spoke to anyone in all the Bible. And as I'm reading these, I, I have to remind myself that this is Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who is saying to the church of Laodicea, you disgust me. You make me sick. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because I just don't see Jesus as that kind of person. When I think of Jesus, I think of the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. She did it. She was guilty. She was a prostitute. The religious were condemning her but Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? And she looks around because he'd run them off. And she said, none here, Lord. And he says these words to her, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. I think of the same Jesus when he was betrayed by one of his best friends, Judas. And they come and arrest him in the garden. And they're going to crucify him, and Jesus knows what's going to happen, and Peter draws out his sword. I love Peter. Peter draws out his sword and cuts the Roman soldier's ear off. These are the guys that are going to spit on him and mock him and beat him and nail him to a cross, and Jesus stops and heals the Roman soldier and puts his ear back on him. I think of the Jesus that when he was hanging on the cross, and they're laughing at him, and hailing him as king of the Jews. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I think of Jesus when Peter said, Lord, I'll never leave you. I'll never deny you. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows in the morning three times, you'll deny me. And here Jesus is at his worst time. And Peter says, I don't know him. I never knew him. I don't know him. And the cock crows. And when Jesus is resurrected, he says to them, go get my disciples, and Peter too. Peter wasn't a disciple anymore. Peter backslid. I think of this Savior that I have. When I walked into the church for the first time, and I walked in a heroin addict, a cocaine addict, and Jesus didn't say, go get cleaned up and then come. He said, come as you are. 
come unto me, all you're the heavy laden and labor. Never, never pointed at my past. People did, religious people did, church people did, but Jesus never pointed me at my past. He only pointed to me at my future. And yet here we have Jesus, this same Jesus that says, you disgust me. You're a disgusting church. And I go back to when we started the seven churches of Revelation. John, John the beloved who laid his head on Jesus', Jesus breast at the Lord's Supper at Passover. And he sees Jesus and he doesn't recognize him because this is not the Jesus that's dressed like a shepherd. This is the Jesus that's dressed like the conquering king that's not coming in on a donkey, but's coming back on a white stallion and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And John didn't even recognize him and he falls down like a dead man. And Jesus said, John, it's me. This is a different Jesus. This is a Jesus not getting pushed around anymore. This is a Jesus that's come to beat up and shut the window and take names. Let's read what it says about him. He says, because, Jesus says, because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, just very quickly before we get into this, what that means is he said, I would that you were hot, or you're cold. And we talked about the waters that came into the Laodicea. Cold water refreshes, the hot water, the mineral water healed. He said, you're not either refreshing nor are you healing. Now think about it. He's saying this to the church, but he's saying this to us as individuals. You call yourself a Christian church. You call yourself a Christian, but in reality, you're good for nothing. The question that we ask every Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, is the world different today than it was this same time last year because of you, because of me, because of our ministry? Is the world different? God doesn't care that we come together and we sing songs. The devil doesn't care that we come together and sing songs. We need to be making a difference in the world. The Lord himself said, you and I, we are the salt of the world. We're the salt of the earth. And if we lose that saltiness, then we're good for nothing. And, and I wonder if the church of Laodicea is an example of the last day's church. Not everybody, not 100%, but in a big part, we gather together and we have smoke going and we have lights going and we have all this going. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with it. I like a show. But at the end of the show, I love what Creflo Dollar said to us one time. He said, I don't mind people falling down when they get prayed for, but when you get up, something ought to change. I don't mind coming together and having the, uh, the I, I like this. I like the, all this. I like, I, I think we, we ought to do the best we can. But when we leave here in the, in, in the afternoon, when we go to work on Monday, we ought to be something that's bringing light into darkness, not just being entertained on Sunday. Look what he says here. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy, and have no need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, we went all over this last week, but just to, just to lead us into the, what the Lord's answer is. The church of Laodicea was an extremely wealthy church. As a matter of fact, history tells us that an earthquake hit and destroyed this great church, destroyed most of Laodicea. The Roman government came in and said, let us help rebuild your church and let us help rebuild your city. And they said, you know what? We don't need the government. We've got our own money. We're wealthy enough. We don't need anything. But unfortunately, they were also including that we don't need God. So look at what the answer is. The Lord says to them, because you say you are rich and have no need of anything, you don't know that you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. So look what he says next, and here's the answer to us. Verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me 
three things. Now, in the city of Laodicea, Laodicea was, was known for three main industries. One was they were a banking center for all of Asia. They had great wealth. Two is that they were a textile center that made a, a fabric. It was a glossy black type fab, fabric made of wool that the very, very wealthy would wear. And the third was, is they were a center of medicine. They were actually known for a, a powder, I think it was called pyrogram, that was made from a stone and they would mix it and put it like, like, a, like almost like a consistency of, uh, of batter and put it on the eyes and people would physically be healed. So Jesus, knowing this, says, you think you're rich, but you're really miserable. And you're naked and you're poor. So look what he says in verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Now, once again, I, I want to emphasize something. A lot of times people take these kind of scriptures and they try to over spiritualize them in saying that God does not care about whether or not you have an abundance of finances. That is a false teaching. Oh, I, I, I had to, I, I, I'm going over to the church of poverty over here. No, wait. I, Deuteronomy, the Lord says, when your herds are growing and your flocks are growing and your businesses are growing and you have no need of nothing, everything is good measure, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. Do not forget it is me who gives you the power to gain wealth. Now, say power. Say wealth, wealth. From, God. from God. See, one of the greatest <laughs> one of the greatest lies the devil could teach is that money is bad. Now, I'm, I will say that a lot of preachers over the years have taken a truth and used it to manip manipulate people. I, I know that. We've seen that happen. But just because they use this in a wrong way does not mean it's not true. God gives us power in our hands to gain great wealth. One of the great promises is in the last days, the wealth of the wicked is laid up, stored up. It's not gone. It's stored up for the righteous. Right? For the what? All right, now understand this. God says, I want to give you counsel. I want to give you counsel. Now, we know that Jesus is called Wonderful Counselor. Now, what that simply means is, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Well, you know, uh, I think we don't care what you think. You know, I've been in the way for 30 years. We're quite aware that you have been in the way for 30 years. When the first miracle that Jesus performed was not a miracle of need, it was a miracle of luxury. They're at a wedding. Jesus' mother comes and says, we're out of wine. He goes, so? It's not my time yet. I'm going to open blind eyes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise the dead. Mary, a good Jewish mother, says, doesn't even ignore her son. Somebody said the other day, G you're saying Jesus wasn't Jewish? He was in his father's business. He's 33 years old and still lives at home, and his mother thought he was God. <laughs> totally Jewish. Mary says, whatever he tells you to do, yes. do, it. do it. 
Why? Because they're just like we are. That doesn't make any sense. Let me give you a hint to seeing the blessing of God. If he says it, do it, because he is the wonderful counselor. He will never, he's the shepherd that leads us beside still waters. Sometimes he's got to make us lay down in green pastures. That's why, that's why, you know, we're going to do a series on uh, Summer of Miracles, and one of the things we're going to talk about is the tongue. But the, the, the tongue, why, why when they walked around the walls of Jericho, why when they walked around the wall, the Lord said, here's what you do. You walk around, but don't say anything. Because, you know, well, this doesn't make any sense. Look how big those walls are. Look, oh my gosh, this is, a, I'll never, this is never going to work. You know, I, Jesus says, shut up. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. If he says, take a rock and throw it at a giant, take the rock and throw it at a giant. If he says, get out of the boat and walk on water, get out of the stinking boat and get on the water. If he says, bring me uh, water pots, used for the purifying of the Jews. Well, why should we bring water pots? We already have wineskins. Yeah, but you can't put new living wine in an old wineskin. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. He is the wonderful counselor. You know, I, 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 in all the studying I did, I didn't find anybody that actually focused on the word counselor. I give you counsel. But when I read it, it just hit me. He, he's not going to make you do it. I'm going to make you be blessed. I won't be blessed. (laughs) Sometimes we're like the little child where the mother says, you sit in that corner and don't get up. And the kid says, I may be sitting on the outside, but I am standing on the inside. (laughs) Right? That's us. Let me tell you something. You and I are stupid. The Bible says, call no man fool. You and I are stupid compared to his wisdom there's a way that seems right unto stupid people but he is wonderful counselor amen just do it he says i give you counsel it's amazing i don't know why it just grabbed me to 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 study the word counsel But the word counsel in Hebrew has several different words. One is yash, which means a purpose and a plan. I have a purpose for what you do, and I have a plan on how that's going to come out. I give you counsel. Why? I'm not telling you why. (laughs) It's none of your business. It's called faith. I have a purpose, and I have a plan. Another word for counsel in there is melek, which has the root word of king and milk. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? The word counsel comes from a root word meaning king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Christians have sometimes a hard time realizing that the kingdom of God is not a democracy. Well, you know what? I vote. No, there's no, no. I'm king. (laughs) And milk. Here's an amazing thing. Milk. How are these words consul, how are the words consul connected with king and milk? He's the king. And he's a wonderful king. And the milk of the issue is whatever he tells us to do, do it, because he is a wonderful counselor. That's the milk. And once you get the milk of that, that he'll never lead you astray. He'll never tell you something that will hurt you. He only wants to tell you something that is good. Once you get that, then you can move on to more solid food. The word of God, right? It also is the root word uh, that is, how do we say it in... uh, Kaudith, it means secret. That when God tells you to do something, you may not understand it, but in reality, there is a secret that's involved with this. Now watch, let me show you a secret from the wonderful counselor. He said, I counsel you to buy me gold refined in fire. Now, what's unique about our church and our ministry is that 
we study the Bible through the Hebrew eyes of a Jesus, a Jewish Jesus, and not a Roman Catholic Jesus or a Baptist Jesus or a Gentile Jesus. When I studied this, almost everybody that talked about gold refined in the fire, they talked about trials and tribulation. And I understand that there's part of that and there's part of our teaching that when you go through trials and, and tribulation, it refines you like fire. But here he's not talking about that. Here he's talking about, let me read it again. He said, I counsel you to buy from me. I counsel you to buy from me, number one, gold refined in the fire. Now, I understand trials and tribulations. I, I understand that. I'm not saying anything bad about that. But he's not talking about that here because he's, cause he's talking to rich people who God made rich. I give you power in your hands to gain wealth, and you're doing nothing good with it. So combine that to this revelation. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. And I want to show you a teaching that every one of us knows, but I have to be honest, very few really understand. Look at Matthew chapter 6, Look, verse 19. The Lord says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, l let me give you the Hebrew understanding, the rabbinical understanding of this. First off, first off, Jesus is not saying it is wrong to have a savings account. I've heard so many preachers teach. I taught this, you know, because I was raised in that the God doesn't want you to have homes and God doesn't want you. It's all about the kingdom of God. It, yeah, it is all about the kingdom of God, but you're part of the kingdom of God. And my Bible says it's my father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, not someday, but today. Somebody ought to shout amen. Amen. You, we, we know the story, and usually it's connected with this. We know the story of the rich young ruler where he comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, do this and do that and do the other thing. And he said, boy, I've done it all. And then Jesus says, one thing you lack, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Yeah. Now, let me tell you something I bet you've never heard before. Only Jesus could tell a person to do that. Only Jesus could. You know why? Because in ancient Jewish wisdom, you are forbidden by God to give everything away. Oh, I see. I see. I, there's, that, there's that Christian poverty mentality jumping right on you. In ancient Jewish wisdom, you are forbidden by God to give everything away. Because if you give everything away, now instead of you being someone that can help somebody, you're now someone who has to receive charity. Come on, Pastor. Are you hearing me? So only Jesus could have told the rich young ruler, give it all away. And Jesus, if he would have said, yeah, I'll do that, Jesus would have either said, I'm just testing you, just like Abraham and Isaac, I'm just testing you, or the moment he did that, Jesus would have opened the windows of heaven and poured him out such a blessing because the Bible says God will be no man's debtor. Amen. Amen. So only Jesus, a rabbi can't tell you to give everything away. A pastor can't tell you to give everything away. The White House can't tell you to give everything away. You are forbidden by God to make yourself poor. Why? It's this, it's this teaching right here. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, when we get to heaven, <laughs> 
God is not going to open up the bank vault and say, okay, how much I owe you? <laughs> right? In heaven, the streets are gold. In heaven, there's no sadness, there's no sickness, there's no poverty, there's no hatred, there's no racism, there's no violence, there's no drug addiction. It's done. When we get to heaven, it's done. So when the Lord says, lay up to yourselves treasures in heaven, you have to hear what a Jewish Jesus is saying. When, when Tiz got sick with cancer and Lion got sick with cancer, we got contacted from not only Christians, thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians all over the world, and God bless you for your prayers and the answer to the prayer, but we got, we got contacted by Jews all over the world, rabbis all over the world, and they said, we're going to the synagogue or we're going to the Western Wall or we're praying that God will grant you zechut. That word zechut in Hebrew is merit. The word zehut is treasures in heaven. Every time you do something good for somebody, God takes that and he puts in your name, in your bank account, in your heavenly safety deposit box, a merit for a blessing to come back on your life. So God says every time you, for every 90,000 lives that you save in Israel, I'm putting a count into your life that if you ever need it, you can call upon him and he will repay you because God will owe no man nothing. Somebody say amen. amen. But if you don't have anything in heaven, you may be rich here on earth right now. But in reality, you're poor. I could be a multi, multi millionaire. Wait, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. God, there are no, there are no words in ancient Hebrew for coincidence. I could be a multi, multi millionaire. But when I needed a mir we needed a miracle on Lion, we needed a miracle for Tiz, we were poor if we had not treasures in heaven. Is anybody hearing me? Is anybody hearing me? When we go on television, and I'm not being mean or anything, but we're not raising funds to buy myself a $70 million airplane. We're not raising funds to buy me this or buy me that. We're raising funds that we can make a difference in the world. And when you give to that, God takes that merit and he puts it up in heaven. And it's time we start realizing it may look in these last days like we're rich, but God said, unless you're doing something to change the world and make the world a better place, he said, you make me sick. Yes. Come on. Come on. Say amen. amen. Is it okay to say that? Yes. He said, buy me gold refined in fire. Yes. Let me say this real quickly. I told Tiz there's so much, I'm going to have to skip the last part just to get to the, the answer to this. If you look at, at a ring you wear on your finger, that ring is... What, a 24 karat gold, 22 karat gold? It's not pure gold because there are still impurities in it. The Bible talks about refining your money because it's filthy lucre. I don't have any money on me. It's filthy lucre. I looked up the word and I was shocked. It's simple. It means your money's dirty. Your money has been in the hands of drug dealers. Your money's been there. Your money's been here. Your money's been with negative people. Your money's been touched by, by, by cruel people. Um, you know, I, I, I don't remember. I can't, years and years ago, I taught on this, and I think it's like 80% of $100 bills on up have been touched by cocaine. And so God says, when you come into my house, circumcise that money. And it goes from being money that is cursed into money that is blessed. Now, I'm going to show you something here, but let me just make it real simple first. Would you rather have 90% of blessed money or 100% of cursed money? It's not hard. It's not hard, right? 
it, it, it's a pretty simple statement. But God says, I want money. I want you to buy from me gold that's refined in the refiner's furnace. Pure gold, and I'll just say this quickly, pure gold, gold that you wear on your hand and everything, if you look at it, you can shine it up as much as you can. You can maybe see your reflection, but it's distorted. But pure gold keeps being refined and keeps being refined and keeps being refined until the forger, the refiner, can see his unblemished image in that gold. Like a mirror. Unblemished image. And pure gold is very pliable. So when the Lord says, I want you to buy me, buy from me gold, I want your money to have my image in it. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus said these words. He said, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. The reason why the church of Laodicea made God sick is, number one, they forgot it was him who gave them the power to get wealth. Oh, no, but pastor, we study, we work, we do that. It's God who gives you power in your hands to gain wealth. And then once they had the wealth, they did nothing with it. Ancient Jewish wisdom says we are never more like God than when we help make somebody's life better. In Genesis chapter 1, the Lord says that we are made in his image, right? We are made in his image. Wherever you go, tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everywhere Jesus went, he went to help somebody. He went to bless somebody. And then he says, I give you dominion over the earth. That word dominion in Hebrew simply means I give you the responsibility to take care of earth. When the Bible says we are the righteousness of God, that word righteous there means acts of kindness. When God wants to bring acts of kindness to the world, he does it through the children of God. This is why the Lord says that if you see someone, if you see a brother or sister who's hungry or who's naked and you say to them, well, God bless you, be clothed, be blessed, be fed, be warm, be gone. He said, you have done nothing. You feed them, you clothe them, you take care of them. You get them out of the emergency situation. You do that. And when you do that, you are in the image of God. I don't know about you, but God, re- well, I do know about you. God reached down in the middle of my drug addiction, my gang life, my, po- my poverty, and he pulled me out. And he said, now what I've done for you as my father, has done for me you go do it and when you do it we are never more like God than when we do something to make the world a better place in Hebrew it's taught it's called tikkun olam healing a broken world is the world Laodicea a better place today we you know uh, we we seem to think that being a great church means that the pastor's driving a Bentley. What? Can, can I be honest with you? If somebody gave me a Bentley, I'd sell it. Because you can't go around with a sign on there. It was a gift. Right? Although I would drive it for a week. <laughs> Where was I before I said that? (laughs) Ancient Jewish wisdom says, with tikkun olam, repairing a broken world, is, is the opportunity granted to every person to become a partner with God in creating good on earth. The Lord says, you're good for nothing. 
I've given you this money and you're not helping anyone. You know, so many times we think, you know, when, 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 I, when we get there, you know, when, when my harvest comes in, something Tiz teaches all the time, she taught on television on our, in the studio this last Wednesday, you don't give from a harvest. You give to a harvest. You know, I can remember when Israel was getting high, the hospital in Haifa was getting hit by terrorist bombs 12 seconds away coming across the bay. And the, they were aiming at the hospital. And so I went to you guys, how many years ago was this, and said, we need to, let's do something to help these terrorist victims. And they weren't just Jews. They were Jews and Christians. Haifa is the center of Baha'i faith. They, were, they didn't care if they were hitting Muslims. In fact, there was a Muslim neighborhood right at the base of the hill where the hospitals, and that's where the bombs were getting. So we raised $10,000 and took it and gave it to Israel for B'nai Zion Hospital to save people from terrorist attacks. Now we're doing a million and a half. It, 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 what if we said, well, someday we're going to do a million dollars. And we hear that all the time. You know, someday pastor, I'm going to get a million dollars. And I believe you're going to do that. I believe you'll do that. Amen. But we got to start where we're at. Right. Let me throw one more thing in when he says, purchase from me gold through the refiner's fire. Here's an interesting thing, and I'm just going to throw this. For the last few months, I've been, I've been mad about what they're teaching our kids in school. You know, to me, if you're teaching that kind of thing, you're a pedophile. If you're pushing that kind of agenda that you're going to teach babies about trans babies oh we're not trying to impress them impress put an impression on them we're, we're not trying to do that D listen to me our kids believe a little fat man in a red suit right. drives flying reindeer right. and comes down a chimney Come and on. brings <laughs> presents and puts them under your tree right. they believe that until they're 10 11 12 years old don't tell me you're not trying to put an impression on our kindergarten kids. I'm telling you something. If God would let me, I'd smack you in the lips. Shame on anybody. That's none of your business. Shame on you. Amen. And you know, when I was studying this thing on gold and gold, he said, in, in the refiner's fire, because it, it needs it when, when God, as God blesses at whatever stage, we need to be a blessing. Yes. This is called prosperity with a purpose, right. not just prosper so you can live in beautiful houses. God says, yeah, you can live in beautiful houses right. and, 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 and uh, have vacation homes and all this other stuff, but you need to be doing something to, to, to refine, because when they see your good works, they will glorify your father in heaven. Amen. Oh, come on. Somebody say Amen. But I'm just going to throw a side note in that when I was studying this about gold, pure gold, God says, when you build me a house, whether it was the Mishkan in the desert or it was the permanent temple in Jerusalem, he said, I want you to cover the beams with gold. I want you to cover the panel with gold. I want you to cover this with gold. I want the, the threads to have gold. But then he teaches something that I don't think I've ever heard anybody teach. He said, if times get hard, and you're at war or something, he said, don't worry about the gold beams. Don't worry about the gold panel. Don't worry about the gold threads. But there's one thing you must still cover in gold. When you go into the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant, there are two cherubim, two angels that are children. He said, never don't cover those. Because I don't care how hard it is, you stand up for the children, you stand up for the little ones, you stand up for them that can't stand up for them, and, and shame on anybody that votes for somebody that is pro-abortion, shame on you, shame on you. God said, I can do without anything. I can do without everything, but I don't care how hard it is. The children of God must stand up with God for the babies of the world. Somebody ought to shout amen. 
And I'll, I'll just throw this in, as, and i got to get to the end of this, but I'll just throw this in. That's why, this is just the way God made me. Um, there's a lot of good things that you can do in the world. But when it comes to our orphanages and our feeding programs, and in, in Haiti and Dominican and Cuba and 50,000 meals to children, 50,000 meals to children every month in Africa and a Hava school for the broken children and all that we do, a huge part of what we do is for children. And now I know why God's laid that on our hearts and why you're so generous in doing that. We don't even mention the orphanages. We don't even hardly mention the feeding programs. We don't hardly mention. But so much that we do is for children. And now I know why. Because no matter what's going on, God tells us, do not forsake my babies. And I'm telling you something, that is for babies that are born and that is for babies that will be born. Somebody ought to shout amen. All right, I'm going to get off of that. Although, <laughs> the next thing he says is purchase for me. L l let's go read it because I want to say it exactly the way Jesus says it. Purchase for me gold refined in fire that you may be rich. Uh, look at me a second. Everybody say rich. rich. I believe, th I'm going to prophesy over you. Come November, we're going to get the house and send it back. Come November. You know, I like what one Hispanic lady said on the news the other day. She said, amongst Hispanic people, the present administration is at like 25%. She goes, I want to know who you 25% are and what are you smoking? We can't get baby formula for our own babies? Shame, 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 shame. There goes again back to the children. Amen. Buy for me gold refined with fire that you may be rich. Say rich. rich. Come November, we're going to get the house and send it back. You're going to see gas price. They're going to, they're going to start crushing the gas prices again because, because they're going to start to make it look good. Look good before the election. But I'm going to tell you something. Come November, things are going to turn around. But those of us who have ears to hear and eyes to see right now, we're going to set the pace in the good measure, pressed down, shaking together, overflowing category. So we need to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen. So that, what he's talking about is doing good. Every, every, every week you start off the, the Sabbath as we're entering into the Sabbath. Every week the Sabbath is the weekly window of heaven. On the Sabbath, God pours all your blessing. Now it may come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It may come. But on the Sabbath, God pours all the blessing that he has in store for you and I that day. But before we go into God's blessing, we first put money in the stedka box, the box of righteousness, yeah. the box of charity. Yes. Last night, Katie came in and I saw her opening our stedka box in our house. And I said, taking yourself alone? <laughs> and she said, there's, there's a, somebody in the church that has need. And so she's taken our stead cow box that we've given so far this year to give to that person in need. That's what it's about. So before God releases us our blessing, he always first gives us a chance to be a blessing. That's prosperity with a purpose. All right, I have 15 minutes. Next, look what he says next. And this, this, is, this is, I'm gonna say it real quick that you may be rich and buy from me a white garment, white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness not be revealed. Now, almost everybody that I read, every, almost everybody I read said that white robe is the robe of righteousness that we receive from forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. Now look at me, look at me. We are righteous because he made us righteous. 
That is absolutely true. But when he says, buy from me a white robe, it cannot be the robe of righteousness or holiness or forgiveness because you can't buy that. It's a gift. You cannot, you, there's, you could give a zillion dollars. Now, if you, let's say you gave this, came and said, Pastor, here's a million dollars. Uh, can you go to the Lord for me? I absolutely, I will take your million and go to the Lord for you, but it won't do any good. <laughs> I shouldn't have threw that last part in. You can't buy it. It's a gift from God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Can I have an amen? amen. But here he says, buy from me a robe, a white, buy from me white garments. Let me show you. Revelations 19, 17. Revelations 19, um, excuse me, Revelations 19, 7 and 8. Read with it. Well, let me turn to it. They're up there smoking their cigarettes or something. <laughs> Revelations Revelations 19. <laughs> Revelations 19. There we go. I knew you could do it. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready, verse 8, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clear and, now see, I wanted, I asked JP, JP, I asked for new King James, not, I mean, King James, not new King James. Anyway, clean and white, it says in King James, the original, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So here he's talking about gold that is refined in fire. And then he says, buy from me white, not bright white linen, <laughs> which are the righteous acts, the acts of charity from the saints. And so when you and I do things to make the world a better place. We do things to tikkun olam. God says for you, I will clothe you in white robes, which are because of your acts of kindness. Now, let me, let me tie this down. Years ago in Flagstaff, <laughs> you're still fired. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago in Flagstaff, when I first got saved, before I was married, we'd always have prayer meeting in the church, um, six o'clock in the morning. I would always get up and pray about an hour before I went to prayer meeting. We'd come home and I would pray about an hour before I went to bed. And I was praying and I had a vision. It, all of a sudden, it was five, six, seven hours, and I was out of my prayer, and, and I, it felt like 10 seconds. I've had that happen three times in my life. This was the first. And in that, God showed me some things about the church. And he said, I want you to go to your pastor. He said, God, speaking to your pastor about knocking the walls out and expanding the sanctuary. Go and tell them that. I want you to tell your pastor that not to worry. Every time we went out on the streets and witness, we'd get arrested. I've been in jail more times for sharing Jesus than I ever was for selling drugs. <laughs> not, not a whole lot more, but. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, go tell your pastor I've got somebody that's going to take care of this. Every time we go out, we go out every Saturday and we go out and witness. We go out Friday nights to where all the clubs were and everything. We share our testimony, share Jesus. And he said, then he said, and this is, uh, I saw this whole vision. Then he said, now open your eyes. I want to speak to you face to face. And it was so real. I went, and I 1 million percent expected to see him. 
and he wasn't there. And I said, wow. And so the next morning we went to prayer. That morning, the next morning I went to prayer and I'm down praying on my knees on the bench in the church. And all of a sudden my pastor comes down and he's praying next to me. And we're praying for a while. And all of a sudden he says, Larry? I said, yes, sir. He goes, are you supposed to tell me something? Now I'm only saved a couple months. And I said, well, he goes, I'm praying. And he said, I I really felt the Lord say, he told you to tell me something. And I said, well, Pastor Ron, I said, I I did. But but after God's told me these things, he said, look up and I want to talk to you face to face. And there was no one there. So I thought it must be a match issue. He said, what did God tell you? And I said, are you thinking about knocking the walls out because a revi- great revival is coming? He goes, he started tearing up. He goes, I, you know, we don't have the money, but he goes, I feel like God's doing that. And he, I said, God said he's going to take care of that. And he said, what's the other thing? And I said, he said, when we go down the streets, because what, what, this, these people were trying to do is bankrupt, bankrupt the church. And so every time we would go down and witness on Jesus and getting all these drug addicts saved and prostitutes saved and everything, we get arrested. Then we had to bail out and we had to get a lawyer. And what we found out from people, they're trying to bankrupt us. I mean, we're just a street church. That's all we were. And so I said, he's got somebody that's going to take care of you. The next Saturday, we went down to the streets and we're witnessing, and all of a sudden, here comes the cops. Man, they're throwing handcuffs on me. They're throwing handcuffs on the pastor. And all of a sudden, this guy comes out, and his last name was Babbitt. And the Babbitts own Arizona. <laughs> Governor Babbitt. Yeah. They're yeah. Mormons, I believe, right? They were Mormons. Yeah. And, they got, and he walks up to the police officer. and They got me cuffed. They got my pastor cuffed. And he walks up to the police officer and says, you arrest them, and I guarantee you, they will own this city. We will sue you, and they will own this city. Now, this is the most powerful family, and so it turned all around. And so I said, but then I I, I said, Lord, the the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Larry, open your eyes. He said, I want to speak to you face to face. And I said, open my eyes, and, and Pastor Ronnie wasn't there. And he looked at me, and he said, it's coming. It's coming. And I thought of that. He said, God will speak to you face to face. And I thought of that when I was writing this down on the white garments. And listen what the Lord says in Psalm 1715. He says, in righteousness, and the word righteous there means acts of kindness. In righteousness, David said, I shall behold your face. When we do acts of kindness, when we give to help the world. It's called, it, it, it's called drawing close to God. And I thought not only in these last days are there going to be signs and wonders and miracles and prophets and prophetesses. If God can trust us with the stuff he paves his streets with in these last days, he's going to trust us with open windows of heaven, but he's going to trust us with the supernatural power of God. Why? Because when we, when we do acts of kindness, he said, you will draw so close to me. And I believe there's going to be visitations, but also when we do acts of kindness, they will see God in our face because wherever we go, we're to tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's nothing more like God than when we do acts of kindness. I'm going to throw this in real quick because I only have a couple minutes. They also, is, it means that the, 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 the white robes represent the leaders in the kingdom of God. The leaders of the kingdom of God. I got another whole page, but I'm going to close with this. When I'm reading this, the next thing he says was, buy from me I salve. And what that literally means is, is that in the city, there were people that were physically blind. But the church of Laodicea was spiritually blind. I've got a whole teaching on this. But how many times did Jesus say, they have eyes, but they don't see? Right? They have eyes, but they don't see. But blessed are you who I have eyes to see. He said, you've seen eyes physically healed, but I will heal you of spiritual blindness. I'm going to throw one statistic in, and then I'm going to close this with a a great revelation. 
I read this when I'm talking about our generation. And is this the church of Laodicea? I've made you rich. I've made you rich. But you make me sick. Now, this is not us. This is not us. We constantly, every week, are doing something. We, every week, we're doing something. But listen to this, this stat that came up. On average, people give a smaller percentage of their income today than they do, did during the Great Depression. That's shocking, isn't it? The Great Depression, remember you've seen it where everybody's in rags and people are in line just trying to get a job and soup kitchen and bread kitchen. They gave more in America per person then than we do today. Not us. I, I can brag on us. I can brag on us. We, every time we go to Israel, every, we, every, when we get, first thing we pray up in the, in the morning is we give God praise and glory. Thank you for using us and God use us in a greater way. Amen. Amen. So uh, this is not you. But as far as the world goes, the church of Laodicea was famous for making black garments. And Jesus said, I want you to buy from me a white garment. Let me ask you this. How many of you are Christians? What makes you a Christian? You know, Jesus never called his followers Christians. The people called them Christians because they acted like Christ. Give me an amen. amen. Because they acted like Christ. We have a job. We have a mission. The Lord says, before you were ever born, you were created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. You're created for good works. The more God gives you, he wants you. He wants you driving beautiful cars. He wants you debt free. Say amen. Every time I say one, say amen. He wants you, your businesses and your job. He wants you to have the raise at work. Amen. He wants your business to explode. Amen. He wants to create wealth in you and your family. Amen. But he also wants you to be a blessing. Amen. Now, look, let me close with this. I'm, I'm, I'm two minutes over and I'm, I'm going to cut out all this amazing, wonderful teachings that I have on here. <laughs> Go with me to Revelations 3 again. And, you know, um, I was sitting at my desk. I really am closing on this. This is not a fake closing. I was sitting in my, in my study at my desk, and I finished it, and I thought, what a great teaching. We're blessed to be a blessing. God wants you so blessed all the world to go, why are you so blessed? Why are you so blessed? Well, because I serve Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And God said, when we're, a, we're blessed, we're to be a blessing. And you just keep, you know, you just keep. Anybody have ever been to the Dead Sea in Israel? Ever been to the Dead Sea? The Dead Sea has more minerals flowing into it than any other body of water in the world. I believe that's true. But it's dead. Not one thing lives in it. You know why? No outlet. Everything coming in to bless it should be feeding something else. But it's the Dead Sea. Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, you're the dead church. You're the disgusting church. You're the church that's lukewarm and makes me sick. So I finished last night and I said, okay, well, God, you're teaching us to be a blessing. And I'm in my study and I go, I just can't believe you end it like that. This is the last church. I can't believe you end it like that. Look at what he says. He says, buy for yourself, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see, get the vision back, get the reason why you're here back. And then look at verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Start being what I've called you to be. Start doing what I blessed you to do. S start doing that, right? Yeah. And then look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
And if anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come to him and dine with him and him with me. And to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And he was an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says of the church. And so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, here, here, is, here is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who loved us beyond anything we can imagine. Nobody took his life. He gave it. He could have stopped it. You know that? He could have stopped at any moment and said, they're not worth it. Bring a legion of angels and it's over. Matter of fact, this is the end of the church. The church is not mentioned anymore. And when, the, when he comes back again, he defeats the whole. We don't even do anything. We just sit there and go. And he wipes all, everybody out with his tongue, just poof, speaks it. But he says to this church that makes him sick, I say this because I love you. I want you to wake up. I'm coming quickly. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And when I looked at this, I, I, I remember when as a child, I saw two pictures. Maybe you can remember this one. They're old fashioned pictures. And one is these two little children walking across a little wooden rickety bridge. Remember that with the gardening, garden, guardian angel. And the kids are walking across, you know, you could tell they're not supposed to be there. And the ones reaching way over and the angels are there. And I thought, Lord, that's what you're saying to our kids. You're going you're gonna to salvage our kids. But the other one I remember when I was from a kid is Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And I had the guys pull that up. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And the first thing that hit me is, who's Jesus talking to here? The church. And he's not in it. They're gathered, they're singing, they got smoke and lights and lasers, they're rich, but Jesus isn't inside, he's outside. And when I pulled this up, this, this isn't the exact painting because the exact painting that I studied was, is not as clear, it's not as good, but it's, it's, a, it's a better in the image. And I read the history on the guy, I think his name was Hunter, Hunter that painted it. And somebody wrote to him and said, I, I love your painting, Jesus standing at the door and knocking. He said, but there's something wrong with your painting. You didn't finish it. And he wrote him back and said, what do you mean I didn't finish? He said, look at your door. What's missing? No handle. And the author, the, the painter said, that's on purpose because you don't open the door from the outside you open the door from the inside, right? So I had all of that. I had all of that. Here it is. Jesus said, you make me sick. I'm so angry. I mean, such harsh words. But then at the end, the very last words to the church, I stand at the door and knock. And if you'll, if anyone if anyone, God always has a remnant. If anyone in there opens the door, I'll come in. I'll come back in the church. And I'm thinking about this in the last days. I'm thinking about this when we're having pastors fall and all kinds of corruption and all kinds of stuff. And we're more interested in what Hollywood says about us and and, you know, one reporter reporting on a church in New York said it's more like a nightclub than it is a place of worship. A reporter says that. And so I'm sitting there. I have all this. I'm done. I'm in, in my study. And I said, Lord, you're not going to leave us like this. So I went to history. And I looked up the history of the church of Laodicea. God... We, the scholars call it the disgusting church, the lukewarm church, the church that makes God sick. But I looked up the history, and you know what the history of the Laodicean church is? 161 years later, they were the center of council for all the churches in Asia. 
they lasted so much longer than many of the other churches that folded and fell and left. And so God says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm knocking at the lukewarm church. I'm knocking at the disgusting church. I'm knocking at the church that makes me sick. But at the end, it is not the disgusting church. It is not the lukewarm church. It is the renewed church. They did exactly what God wanted and opened the doors and Jesus came. Somebody ought to give God a clap offering. I just, I just felt, stand with me all of the building. We're closed. I, I, forgive me, I'm seven minutes over. I, I just, I just, I was sitting there in my study and I said, Lord, you can't leave us the lukewarm church. You can't leave us the disgusting church. And the Lord showed me. He said, no, I knocked and they opened the door. It is not the disgusting church. The last church is not the disgusting church. The last church is not the lukewarm church. The last church is not the church that makes God sick. It is the restored church. And I said, Lord, I told the guys in the back, I didn't tell them what the end was. I said, receive this as a Bible prophecy from the Lord, because we're not going out. We're not going home with a moan. We are going out with a shout. We're about to have a fresh visitation from the power of God. Do you receive that this morning? I believe it. In our music, in our prayer, in our worship, in our giving, in our finances, in our singing, in our teaching, in our revelation, in our family, God is bringing a spirit of renewal because we're going out a glorious bride. As every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Forgive me for going long. I know we got to go out and eat all kinds of good stuff. But as we're here right now, first off, do you need to be restored? This is Jesus knocking on your heart's door. Or do you need to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? As every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I'm telling you, this is from here on, the church is gone. But I believe we're, we're, we're going into a season of great blessing and great joy and great prosperity prosperity and great signs and wonders and miracles, great anointing. I believe we're going in an amazing time. The Lord's knocking on your heart's door. Will you open it up and let him in? Let him in. As every head is bowed, every eye is closed, very quickly all over this building, say, Pastor Larry, remember me in prayer. I want to give my life or I want to restore my life to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. If you do, remember me in prayer, Pastor. Lift your hand up all over the building and hold it there the whole time. Hold it there the whole time that I say this. I see that hand, 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 that hand. I see that hand, 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 that hand. Keep them up, that hand. Keep them up, that hand. Keep them up, that hand, that hand. Hand, that hand, keep him up. That hand, that hand. Takes me a while. I'm coming over to the side. That hand, that hand, that hand. Keep him up. That hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. God bless you. That hand, 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 God bless you. Give them a great big clap offering. Amen.